was 16 years old, which is a heck of a time to decide to follow Jesus because it is a time when you are being bombarded by pretty much every sin on the planet. I didn't really have a moral conviction because I didn't grow up around faith, but that changed when I was 14. My oldest brother had a guy that he worked with, Dave Gordon, out at Delta on the ramp at night. And uh, Dave was different. He invested time in me. And the more I got to know Dave, the more he began to share the reason he was different. It was because he had a, this relationship with Jesus Christ. Who was I to be having my feet washed by this camp counselor? And, you know, it, it just completely changed my heart. And it, uh, at that moment and at that day, I accepted Christ. And then the pastor said, so Jesus died to pay for your sins. You don't have to pay for your own sins. Jesus died to pay for your sins, but you need to ask him to forgive you. So sitting on the pew that night in church, I just began to pray inside my little heart. Jesus, please forgive me, I'm so sorry. Uh, it was the first time that the knowledge of Christ and what he did for me it took hold of my heart and my mind, and, and those two things melded together. And I answered the altar call and accepted Christ as my personal savior. I remember the pastor talking about heaven and hell, and obviously when you're eight, heaven sounds like a better deal than hell, so I chose heaven. And that wasn't the end of my journey, that was literally the beginning, the first step on a long and winding journey uh, that I'm still on. Thank you for joining us for worship today. One of our primary desires is to connect with you during this worship experience so that we can continue to communicate, find ways to minister with you and your family, and find ways that our church can serve and worship with you. You can do that by taking your smart device and texting the word CONNECT to 797979. You'll get a simple electronic form you can fill out that will allow you the opportunity to communicate with us. Also, if you'd like to get a daily prayer reminder during this season, you can use that same number and text the word RISE UP, all one word, to 797979, and we'll send you a daily update on how you can be praying during this time. Also, our website homepage has been redesigned to give you all the tools we're currently working on for serving locally, praying, going, worshiping, all of the ways we're seeking to encourage your family, children, and students during this season. You can go there to wubc.org or cpoint.org and find all of those resources as well as communicate with us. Today, we're gonna to worship together and Pastor Roger Patterson, our senior pastor, will be bringing the word as we continue this series into the unknown. While seemingly everything has changed, our mission at West University Baptist Church and Cross Point Church Bel Air has not changed. It is to lift our city and the world by generously giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for being here today. Let's worship together.
you've done for me.
I've really enjoyed worshiping together this morning collectively as the church. The truth is, while we're scattered about in our houses, uh, we are certainly not separated because we are one as the church. Uh, we're in the middle of this exciting series called uh, Into the Unknown, and we're walking through the wilderness journey. And Roger will be walking us through that in just a minute. And there's some beautiful pictures that we see of God all throughout the wilderness. And one of those that I want to point out right now is that we see God as the first and most generous giver. Uh, we see God abundantly providing water and food and direction and guidance for His people as they go to a place where they've never been before. And uh, so we have the opportunity right now to reflect God as the first and most generous giver by us ourselves as the local church exercising this ability to be generous as well. And so right now, I want to ask you to pull out your smartphone or your computer, or maybe you continue to write a physical check uh, to our ministry here at West University Baptist and Cross Point Church. However you give, we're just going to give you some space in the next few minutes to give uh, to the work that God is doing right here in our church. You know, all around Houston and really all around the world, we're already pinpointing and identifying ways in which we can lift our city by generously giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our mission and that's what we're all about. And in this season, we're already seeing ways in which we can do that. And so as you give, this helps us to accomplish that mission. It really funds what God's called us to do. And so if you take out your smartphone or your computer or your checkbook, you can go to cpoint.org or you can go to wubc.org and give. So go ahead and do that now as we continue to worship. Thanks.
is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other Today's reading comes from Exodus 12, 21 through 28. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of the house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this rite as a statue for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the people of Israel went and did so as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did.
Welcome to worship. Would you join me in prayer? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. It's the day you've made. We rejoice. We are glad in it. Uh, Lord, I thank you uh, for a chance to once again stand before your people and speak your words. I pray blessing upon the word of God proclaimed today. Uh, Lord, just your hand, your anointing. I pray that it would minister deep into our hearts, uh, that there would be a measure of faith that causes us to walk uprightly, to walk with confidence, to walk with peace. Lord, I pray again for our city. I pray for our city leaders. I pray for our doctors and our nurses and our clinicians, our, our, our researchers. Lord, I pray blessing upon them, your hand over them. Lord, we pray for each person that is ill in our medical community, in the medical center, in the hospitals throughout our city. Would you restore them, Lord Jesus? We pray against the movement of this virus across our city, across our land. And Lord, we stand confident that you are the Lord, our healer, that you heal all our disease. You redeem our life from the pit. So we bless you today. We love you and we worship you in Jesus name. Amen. If you have your Bible, let's open it to Exodus chapter 2 and Exodus chapter 15. That's Exodus chapter 2 as well as Exodus chapter 15. And as you're turning there, I want to highlight for you for just a moment our community groups. Our community groups are still meeting online via Zoom. And if you're not yet in a community group, you can go to the homepage of our websites, cpoint.org or wubc.org, and there is a place that you can click on a community groups tab, and there's some information there that you can reach out to us and we can connect you in. It's a great time to connect into the life of the church via community groups as they're meeting uh, during, uh, during Sunday mornings or throughout the week via Zoom. So join us there. Also, as you turn in your Bible, um, I, I want to make sure you're aware that this coming Thursday night, uh, Aaron and I are going to do a special service. It'll be live stream service to you for Monday, Thursday. We're going to have a special time of the Lord's Supper together. So you're going to want to tune in. More information will come on that as well. You know, I was listening to the radio the other day and uh, one of my favorite news commentators had on a guest uh, who actually starred in the MTV reality show Jersey Shore. And he was talking about how he's trying to use his platform for good. And I really respect this news anchor. And he, he said this, and this was, was, was struck me as funny. He says, so, so how, are, how are we to make sense of all of this? And I thought, well, there's a problem right there. You're asking an, an MTV reality star uh, from Jersey Shore to make sense of all this for us. But I couldn't wait to see how he answered that question. And uh, this, this guest on this show says, well, you know, we just need to be united. United we stand. <laughs> and then he caught himself. Then he says, but also united we fall. So we need to maintain social distancing. And I thought to, my, to myself, well, that doesn't really make sense of all of this. But you know, when the media is asking people in Jersey Shore TV to help us make sense of it all, you know we're in the wilderness, right? We talked about that last week, that we are in a season of the wilderness, the wilderness of the coronavirus, the wilderness of an economic downturn, a crashing stock market, uh, joblessness that is on the rise. It's a different time, and it's, and it's a lingering time, and people are saying, how do we make sense of all of this? You see, a wilderness season is a season of uncertainty where nothing is the same. It's a season of fear, where fear potentially is the norm. It's, it's a season where there's a tendency to have a complaining spirit, and overall discomfort is felt frequently. It's a place we would never go to intentionally, but it's also the place where God does his greatest work if we'll let him. Literally in Hebrew, the word wilderness, wilderness means the place where God speaks. So what I'd like to examine today uh, is, is the journey to make sense of the wilderness. And here's my thesis. In the wilderness, you will wander aimlessly until you understand your redemption. Let me say that again. In the wilderness, you will wander aimlessly until you understand your redemption. Are you wandering aimlessly right now? 
In the opening scenes of Disney's Frozen 2, you have a disruption of the city of Arendelle that drives all of the people out of the city. This drives Elsa and Anna, Kristoff, Sven, and Olaf into the unknown wilderness to understand the disruption and try to solve the problem. As they journey into this unknown wilderness, they find two different armies captured and in bondage because of betrayal, murder, and the sin of a king that is holding these people captive. To free all of the people, there's a need for one to die for the many and one to break the stronghold that's holding so many captive. So as the story goes, Elsa will give her life for her people. Anna will heroically break a dam and, and allow the water to flood the valley as a sign of repentance and release of the bondage, freeing and saving all the people. Frozen 2 is a journey of two heroines whose actions set the captive free. You know, it's the hero's journey that often helps us make sense of our journey. So what I want to do is I'm going to step back before the time of the wilderness for just a moment. See, the wilderness, this unknown, this, this place that Israel was taken to prepare them to go into the promised land, the reason they got there is because of the bondage and the slavery and the captivity that we see them in in Egypt. So join me in Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. It says, During those many days the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. See, the Israelites have lived in Egypt now for 430 years. And uh, they knew this was not their home. As a matter of fact, before Joseph died, he told them to preserve his bones and where to bury them when they left Egypt and went into the promised land. So much time has passed that Joseph is forgotten. There's a new king in town and the people of Israel, the, the, the Israelites have been oppressed. They have been enslaved and they've been beaten down. So they cry out to God and, and God brings them a deliverer. God brings them a leader, a man named Moses who had grown up in Pharaoh's household, who made his own mistakes and who fleed to the land of Midian. Moses is a shepherd for 40 years in a wilderness setting where there's a burning bush and God calls him to himself and calls him to go stand before Pharaoh and ask Pharaoh to release the people. Well, if you're familiar with the story of all, at all, Moses goes and he, he asks for their release. And Pharaoh says, not, I'm not going to do it. He says, set my, let my people go. No, I'm not going to do it. Okay, God's going to bring plagues upon you then. And 10 plagues come upon the Egyptians. And it's the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn son that brought about the release of the Israelites from Egypt. Now, in this moment, it's this moment that's the moment of deliverance that Israel will come back to over and over again. It's what will help them make sense of the wilderness journey. So take a look at my outline with me this morning. Take a look at this outline. Into the unknown, in the wilderness, let your moment of deliverance establish who and whose you are. That's the first thing I want you to see. Secondly, in spite of the wilderness, your redemption means you have a future. And third, in the wilderness, we stop and worship Jesus because he's the hero of our stories. So let's work our way through this outline together. In the wilderness, number one, let your moment of deliverance establish who and whose you are. One of the reasons I challenged you a few weeks ago to go online and share your story, to share your faith and how you came to know Jesus Christ is because it establishes you in a season of great uncertainty. Let me show you what I mean. Look at Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Exodus 15 is a song of praise from Moses after God has rescued them. 
Exodus 15, 1 and following. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. What is Moses saying? Moses is saying, wow, God, you've saved us. You have rescued us. You've, you've, you've brought us out of bondage. We will never be the same because you have redeemed us. He's saying the Lord is our, he's our hero. Look at how he's rescued. There is no God like the Lord. He's the Lord of all lords. And this moment of deliverance will be Israel's reference point going forward. As a matter of fact, even before the moment of deliverance comes, God told Moses to make it a memorial day, that it would be a significant moment for the people of Israel. Go to Exodus chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12, verse 14. It says, this day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. As a statute forever, you shall keep it as a a feast. In other words, God is saying, what I'm about to do with you, what I'm about to show you is going to become an amazing moment in your story that you will memorialize it and you will come back to it year upon year upon year upon year, generation upon generation. God was at work to redeem. Friends, your testimony of deliverance is to serve as your reference point for you to establish you and anchoring you, ensuring you know who and whose you are. Allow me to elaborate for just a moment. During Israel's story, what do we see? During their history, uh, during, during the time of wandering, during the time of, of Deuteronomy, where they give, give the next generation the law before they go into the promised land, during the time of the judges, during the time of, of the kings, during the time of the prophets, in the wisdom literature, what do we see? There's one phrase that we see 38 different times throughout all of Israel's history. It's the phrase, brought you out of the land of Egypt brought you out of the land of Egypt. You're going to see this phrase 38 different times throughout the Old Testament. Well, let me just show you two times where it's used. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15. It says, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. As the next generation is about to go into the promised land, He's saying, listen, this moment of deliverance is so important. It's so significant. It defines who you are and whose you are. Now, let's fast forward all the way to the Babylonian captivity. Hundreds of years later, the prophet Daniel is in Babylon. He's in captivity. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 15 and 19, say these words. Daniel 9, 15, and now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. Verse 19 says, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Friends, I could go on and on, hit all 38 of those. But the best thing we should conclude here, the best thing we can do in a time of wilderness is to go back to our point of rescue. Go back to our point of deliverance. Go back to the time when God called you unto himself and let it anchor you today. Because not only does it establish you, not only is it a sure footing to stand upon, but it also informs your tomorrow. It also informs your tomorrow. And that's the second thing I want us to look at as we understand, seek to understand this wilderness journey. Number two here in our outline, in spite of the wilderness, your redemption means you have a future. Isn't that good news? In spite of the wilderness, your redemption means you have a future. Look again in Exodus chapter 12, verse 25. As the 
Passover feast is being described, as the unleavened bread journey is being described, as, as, as preparation is being made, Exodus 12, 25 says this, and when you come to the land that the Lord will give you as he has promised, you shall keep this service. I love that phrase, and when you come to the land that the Lord will give you. Do you hear the future in that? That's what I hear. I see future. This this statement declares the Lord has a plan for you. He has a, a future for you. The wilderness is not your home. It's not permanent. It's not his heart that you dwell here permanently, but it is a place of testing. It is a place of development. It is a place to cultivate and learn obedience. It's a place to learn the goodness of God and find his healing. The wilderness is a place to learn the goodness of God. Flip back over to Exodus chapter 15. Because in Exodus chapter 15, we see these words about the goodness of God and his leadership. Exodus 15, verse 13. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. You've led in your steadfast love who? The people you've rescued, the people you've delivered, the people you have redeemed. And the word steadfast love describes God's leadership. It means loyalty, goodness, kindness, and faithfulness to his covenant. And this is so important. What is his covenant? His covenant is that he called Abraham to a land he would show him and he would give him children. Abraham gave him Isaac, and Isaac gave Jacob, and Jacob, he gave the 12, and, and from the 12 came a nation, and they would have a land, and they would have a people, and they, they would have a law, and from that land would come one to bless all the nations. God was at work. You see, the people of Israel had a future because the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, made a promise with Abraham. He established a covenant, and that's important for us to grasp. You see, your deliverance from bondage, from enslavement and sin, not only comes with rescue for us, but it's also a part of a much, much bigger plan. God was moving a nation into a land to establish them that from them might come the one who would bless all the nations. That was what he was doing then. We can also trust today that he is at work in this moment of history because the Lord's steadfast love guides us to a future he's prepared for us. And that future ultimately is a journey to his holy habitation. You see, moments like this one that we're in, they do something for us. They cause us to long for heaven. They cause us to look to the heavens and say, Lord Jesus, come again. They cause us to long for the appearance of our hero who will come and right every wrong, who will heal every disease, who will make all things new, who will wipe away every single tear. They expose to us the broken down nature of the world in which we live. I was emailing with one of our deacons recently and was checking on his mom. His mom has had a tough run. She lives in an assisted living uh, facility that's been locked down. And within that, he can't go in and see her. So he's on the phone with her every night, checking on her, praying for her, but also reading to her. You know what he's reading? He's reading Randy Alcorn's book, Heaven, that describes what heaven will be like. And as we conversed about that, as we talked over email, it was just like, you know, these times cause us to long for our true and our sure future, our true and our sure home, the the home in heaven God's prepared for us, which causes me to ask this question. Do you know my hero? Do you know my hero? His name is is Jesus. And let me tell you why he's my hero, and he's the hero of so many others. Let's look at this third point of our outline. Into the unknown, in the wilderness, we stop and worship Jesus because he is the hero 
of our stories. Let me take you back to Frozen 2 and Exodus 12. Now you thought those two things would never come together, I'm sure, right? Let me take you back to Frozen 2 for a moment. Elsa dies for all the people. She's said to be the one that bridges heaven and earth, and it's by her death. And then Anna's work to tear down this dam, that this curse is broken. It's a great story, but it's make-believe. But then there's this moment in history, in Exodus chapter 12, a real moment in history where the Israelites are called to sacrifice a lamb. And, and they're to take the blood of the lamb and they're to paint it on the doorposts and across the lentils and, and over the threshold. They're to, 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 to make sure that the blood of the lamb is across all of their doorposts. Can you imagine how all the Egyptians were wondering, what are all of these slaves doing, killing lambs and painting their doors with blood? Well, then we come to Exodus chapter 12. Verse 23, it says, For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lint and the lintel, on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. See, the Lord would see the blood on the doorpost and would pass over. The destroyer would not enter into their homes. The blood of the lamb was spilled, and that blood covered the people and spared them from judgment. Those lambs that were sacrificed, they were considered clean, sacrificed for the unclean as a substitute. They were judged so that Israel wouldn't be judged. But where there was no blood of the lamb, judgment came. This caused the Egyptians to grieve and to wail as the firstborn males in their homes, every single home where there was not blood on the doorpost, the firstborn male perished from the greatest to the poorest in the land of Egypt. This allowed the people of Israel to leave. And the Egyptians gave them all of their gold and silver, their earrings, their jewelry. Get out of here. We want you gone. They plundered Egypt. And the Israelites journeyed through the wilderness there they received the law. Then they went in and possessed the land. And they would take possession of that land so that from them would come one. One, the Christ, the Messiah, who would become the hero for the whole world. Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. He's the anointed from God. He's the Psalm 2 Christ. He's the son of man from Daniel. He's the son of David. He, he's the one who Moses testified would be greater than he is. And he gave his, he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But to many, as many as received him, to them did he give the right to be called children of God, to those who believe on his name. His cousin, John the Baptist, called him. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The writer of Hebrews says it like this. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Why is Jesus my hero? Because by his blood that he shed as the Passover lamb, he secured an eternal redemption for us all. Jesus is my hero because he's our Passover lamb. And that's why I worship him. He offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins and his blood covered us that we might not receive judgment. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, it closes with these words. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And that's why we worship him. That's why we testify to him. That's why we tell others about him. So once again, I want to extend to you the Share Your Faith Challenge. Go on to social media. Use this hashtag, Share Your Faith Challenge. Go on your social media platform and tell your story. Here's who I was before I met Jesus. Here's who I met, how I met Jesus Christ. Here's the difference he's made in my life. Because that will establish you. That will be an anchor for your soul. It will remind you of your future and will help you worship him in the season of worry 
And when you're worshiping, friend, you can't be captured by worry. Let me close with this question. For those of you who are watching, have you had a moment of deliverance? Have you had a moment where you have been redeemed? Is there that point in time that you can go back to and say, yes, here is the moment in which I was rescued, that God saved me? If not, I want to invite you to have that moment right now. It's a simple prayer of taking Christ Jesus into your heart as your Savior and as your Lord. It starts with admitting you're a sinner. A, I admit I'm a sinner. B, I believe that Jesus is God's son, that he died for me and he rose again, conquering sin and death. And C, I confess with my lips my need for him. Friend, would you pray with me right now? Taking Christ into your heart, let this be your moment of deliverance. Even while you're in the wilderness, let it be right now that God brings you into his family. For those who received him, he gave the right to be called children of God. Pray this prayer with me right now. Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe you died for me and you rose again, and I invite you to come into my life, my Passover lamb. Forgive me of my sin. You died once for all. By your blood, my sin is removed. So I confess with my mouth my need for you. Save me, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, if you just prayed that prayer, would you text the word CONNECT to 797979? And in the notes section, just note, I prayed to receive Christ at the end of the pastor's message. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you as he turns his face upon you. May the Lord give you his peace. God bless you as we worship our Lord in this time. have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow Though none go with me I still will follow Though none go with me I still will follow No turning back No turning back The cross before me, the world behind me. This is my heart cry, though none go with me. The cross before me, the world behind me.
I will follow, I will follow the cross before me, the world behind me. I will follow, I will follow the cross before me, the world behind me. I will follow.
Thank you so much for joining us for our online worship experience. If you're a guest, we'd love to learn a little bit more about you and how we can best serve you and your family. If you would text the word CONNECT to 797979, it gives us the chance to learn how we can connect with you and minister to you during this time. Additionally, if you'd like to learn more about resources we're providing, ways to give back, or information about anything our church is offering, we'd love for you to visit one of our websites, cpoint.org or wubc.org. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today and this opportunity to come together across the nation, across the world, um, just to worship you. We thank you for the technology that you've given to us to have the opportunity to worship together, even though we can't be in the same room. We love you, God. We thank you for the opportunities that we have now and into the future to share the gospel. Would you use us in incredible ways during this season and beyond to spread the love of Jesus to anyone and everyone possible? We love you, God. Keep us safe and bring us back together next week to worship you and celebrate what you're doing in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.